Good, thank you. Good, thanks. Thanks for having us. Great, thank you. We're just going to give it just a minute to let um, everyone come in uh, from the link. You'll see a chat pod down at the bottom as you're in the audience. Feel free to write where you're from, what you're most excited to hear about today as we give a few more minutes to let people in. Minnesota, Chicago, awesome. DC, cool, a lot of US places. Oh, Canada. Brooklyn. Brooklyn's there. <laughs> Melbourne, wow. <laughs> very cool, very cool. So right before we get started, you'll see at the bottom, I see you're all very comfortable with the chat pod. You can use that for any type of feedback you wanna give. Uh, if you have any audio or tech issues or Zoom interface issues, feel free to write it in there. Any questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A feature. From there, we'll have Adobe staff monitoring that. Um, Carl, would you like to save questions for the end? Um, typically, if, if I see something in the Q&A pod, if it's relevant to what we're talking about at that very moment, I might just call, call you out and say, you know, oh, so-and-so from Brooklyn has a question, and uh, uh, we'll do it right, in, right during the presentation if it's a good question. So get those questions in there as quickly as you can. Cool. Yeah, so that's great. Please interact as much as possible. We're all remote, and we're all dying for human interaction, so this is our <laughs> chance. Um, and if you're live attending through the RPC conference, please don't forget to stop by the sponsor lounge. Thank you to Adobe for helping make this conference possible. So please take it away, Carl. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Carl Soule. I've been working with Adobe for going on 15 years now in various roles. Um, and I'm super, super happy to have the team uh, from a cultural icon here in America. Uh, the People's Port has been around since as long as I can really remember. Um, and it's been a, a fantastic journey, um, you know, watching the show just uh, evolve uh, with different hosts. But you guys have always kept it, uh, kept the, the formatting of the show uh, it really uh, uh, familiar. It's something that, you know, I'll put on in the afternoon just to, uh, just to enjoy. Um, I want to start by introducing Kelly. Uh, Kelly Irvine is the supervising producer for post-production. And uh, Kelly, you've been with the show for a while. You've got a background, um, you know, going back through, this is now your, the third NLE being used on the show. Yeah, been um, uh, with the People's Court for going on 25 years. Wow. Wow. And uh, Jamie, uh, Jamie is the supervising editor uh, for the People's Court, and you've also been with the show for a long time. Um, I, I have uh, since about 2000. Um, off and on, I, I've I've done other projects and come back, as as I think all of us have. But uh, yeah, awesome. I also like to introduce Scott. Scott Ratner, uh, you are the senior editor and design director. Uh, working both in Premiere and After Effects, as, as I've gotten to know you over the last uh, six months to a year here. Um, when did you join the show? Um, I have been here since essentially day one, 1997, just wow. briefly before Kelly started. Um, yeah, from the time the show came back on the air, I was about two weeks after they started up, I think I came on. Awesome. And if anybody out there hasn't ever seen an episode of The People's Court, we want to give you just kind of a, a, a brief uh, example of this. I'm just going to quickly share my screen here. Um, and uh, thanks to the power of Frame.io, one of our partners, we're going to uh, just quickly run a short clip of the show just so you can get a sense of it. Here we go. This is the defendant, Daniel Benavidez. He says his uncle, who he was forced to live with, was a tyrant who tried to run his life. As far as the phone goes, he was two days late paying him because his paycheck got held up and the hothead turned his phone off. Oh, and money for a shut-off phone? No way. He's accused of making an uncle mad. 
All parties, please get your right hand. What you are about to witness is real. The participants are not actors. They are actual litigants with a case pending in civil court. Both parties have agreed to drop their claims and have their cases settled here before Judge Marilyn Millian in our forum, the People's Court. You see it, come to order, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and jump back out of that. I'll just go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I gotta tell you, when I first got a chance to talk to you guys and uh, help you through a transition to Adobe Premiere, um, that opening like immediately played in my head. What you're about to witness is real. I mean, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the show originally was on the air back in the 80s and uh, there's been different judges and you guys relaunched very successfully in 97. Um, tell me a little bit about like the original, uh, the, the, the nature of the format of the show. You guys uh, uh, produced this in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, and obviously there's a lot of people crammed on set. Do you wanna, um, anybody wanna talk a little bit about uh, the, the nature of what it used to be? Well, we, I think we should really quickly mention that um, that's the original set from the Wapner days. Uh, the show was done in Los Angeles. Uh, it was on for 11, 12, 13 years, I, I, I forget. And uh, when, they, when they restarted the show in 97, it, it was in New York City and they, sh they found the set and they shipped it across the country, set it up in New York. And then a few years ago when we moved to Stanford, Connecticut, they created it up and, um, and put it back in, in Stanford. So um, it's basically the same setup since, uh, since the beginning. I mean, Scott was there when it was set up, you can, explain how the basic layout is, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know what I could say about how it was set up, but it's, it's moved around quite a few times too. We've had to change the orientation and change the adjusted a bit. Um, you know, we, I know over the years contemplated changing it, but it's as big a character of the show as anything. I mean, you know, it's, I think it's so iconic, the doors, the, the set, I mean, you know, and I think initially when, when they built the set, the idea was that it's all about the people and the cases. The set should just sort of blend away, which is why it's not flashy or, you know, super stylized, you know, um, and I think it works that, you know, it, it, you're there to sort of concentrate on the litigants and the judge. And from the, be from the beginning, you know, it was um, <clears throat> shot in a studio environment with a control room. I mean, Scott's worked in, I was thinking about it in live sports, uh, so if you think of it like that with the control room, all the, all it's, it's, it's like a live show in that it's, it's recorded live. There's, there's no takes um, and there's a control room with colors and sound mixers uh, and a whole team uh, uh, great grading the cameras and mixing everything as if it were going live. Um, and so it's, it's recorded live, but the show uh is an hour show, I mean, 40 something minutes um, without commercials. And so there's, and there's two or three cases in a show. So we have to edit that live show, which it's, a, it's just a straight court case. It, it could take the judge 10 minutes or it could take her an hour and 10 minutes. Um, and then the two or three cases have to be cut down um, uh, to fit in, into that. So um, just to give, you know, we've all, Kelly's worked on feature films. I've worked on uh, network dramas where it's once a week. This is an hour show, five days a week, 150 shows in a year. Um, it's a lot of content to move through the pipeline. Um, you know, I don't know, Kelly, maybe you could describe, how, you know, how um, we use the program as it would be done in a live sports uh, recording, and then we use the ISOs. Yeah, uh, so we work with how many cameras? Five cameras, or we did? <laughs> uh, four, four, it was four cameras, um, right? Three, three, and then the side camera. Right, so, um, and we use uh, multi-cam, so we're able to access, you know, to, to make our cut. So, we, we start with the, you know, the line cut that comes, you know, from the director 
and you know we cut it down for time we create the story go back through and use our multi-cam to you know cover the cuts that we've made for time yeah and you guys take advantage of the fact with that kind of production schedule you don't really have a lot of time to deal with um, you know, full mix of the audio. You're not doing turnovers where you're handing things off to different teams to do like final color. It's really a matter of uh, being able to take advantage of that controlled studio environment and then, uh, you know, be able to cut things down uh, and get things cut for time for each episode. Yeah. So with that as just a little introduction, um, you know, if, you, if you happen to watch uh, uh, last what is it called, Last Week Tonight uh, with John Oliver on HBO. Um, the People's Court was actually featured in a small segment there talking about the, uh, the nature of trying to adapt a show like this to remote production. I'm gonna take just a moment to, uh, to share that with you guys because I think it, uh, it kind of shows some of the challenges when you, when you move a show like this, which is studio-based, into a, a remote workflow. And now this. And now, working remotely sucks for the People's Court too. We here at the People's Court are practicing social distancing. So we will be adjudicating cases right here from our very own virtual courtroom. Gentlemen, can you hear me? Yes. Sir. Okay, Mr. Glenn, there's no smoking in court. Yeah, I didn't realize you could see. I don't know why, you, I didn't feel I, like I'm it. sorry, it's a, can I just ask you the stuffed animal that's in your hand? Oh, I'll put it down. It belongs to my nephew. The end table is the one that had the... To, you know I can see you, right? When you roll your eyes at me? Mm-hmm. Stop Please it. bring it very close to me so that uh, I can read I'm it. Sorry, because the picture you submitted into down. evidence... Okay. Oh, boy, the battery's going low. Take a second and put a charger. I don't want to end up losing your testimony. Um, I can do it, but I would have to go into the kitchen. Okay. Please. I think it's in my dog room. <sighs> You want to see my dogs? No, I just want to see the table. Is there some problem, gentlemen? Can you lift your head? Why don't Go you ahead. leave your hand at your earphone? Okay. Well, I you am. can't leave both hands because I need one hand okay. to bring that up to the camera so that I can read it. Okay. All right. I, uh... <laughs> I love that. Um, now that was I want to want to point out that was definitely uh, early on with uh, with just moving to a, uh, a remote production. Um, but just in the nature of how the show was shot, you guys had to go through some radical changes to account for COVID to account for not having that studio environment, but wanting to keep the show, you know, have the same look and feel as it did before. Um, Kelly, you want to just mention like what was going through your minds when uh, you realized what was going on that everything had to had to suddenly move to a remote environment? Uh, well, you know, it, it was a scary time because, you know, I, I think all of us were probably thinking um, we're not going to have a job. Um, we uh, yeah, we we, uh, we had to change everything. And, um, and we had the, you know, the you know, the elements, the story, the people, the litigants, the judge, but how do we, you know, put that on the screen remotely? And um, Scott and Jamie are the geniuses behind that. They really, um, they're the ones to ask about that. Now, Jamie, you want to talk a little bit about like what it was like trying to come up with an idea for this? Well, the, the first challenge, if I, if you remember, was um, finishing the season. So we, we had a certain number of uh, things in the in the can, so to speak. Um, although there's no more cans, uh, but uh, and, and production. I think it was Scott. Was it the last week that was shut down? I think we we literally had one more week to finish, put getting all the cases that we needed for the season, and. Right. Uh, it, it, they were going to try to do it and then someone tested positive on the previous week and the whole thing w was shut down. So the first challenge was delivering the show when they just said, you know, no one can come back to the office. Um, and luckily um, over the last few years, we, we've made some um, incremental movements to, to work remotely um, like one day a week and we would, take the line cut 
home as a proxy and you could work from home and we had some experience, but, but this was the whole thing. It had to be delivered, you know, and we, you know, we, we found some remote um, screen sharing software that allowed audio was the big problem with, with screen sharing. We could remote in, but to edit is another matter. Like you can control your computer and, and you could even at the time interface with Avid and make cuts, but um, to actually edit and hear was a challenge. So I'm sure people know there's a lot of options now on, on the market and we jumped on those and suddenly we were finishing the season from home, remoting into the office essentially and um, uh, getting the, and we didn't have all the cases. So f- for the most part, we went down to two cases in a show instead of three. Um, and we managed to get that season delivered. And then normally there's a hiatus over the summer and we went straight into trying to figure out how to get the show um, back on. And I mean, Scott, you were, you were the one that we just started experimenting with Zoom calls and, and um, what were, you know. Uh, we tried a bunch of things. We did, you know, yeah. Zoom and Skype and NDS, different pieces, pieces of software. I mean, the, the and we'd be the us, litigants and we would try to be like, okay, you right. be the judge and you'll you be the litigants and we do test test cases essentially on Zoom. And it was just, how do you record it in a way, you know, that, that could be full frame and full resolution? Yeah, that, that was a huge problem. I mean, we, we have a very, you know, when you start going down the road of trying all these different options out, you know, you see it on TV with talk shows and they'll have a guest come on remotely and it's like that's one guest for a 10 minute segment if that of a whole show and we have you know and we tape we do i don't know 10 cases in a day with at least two litigants and then we have the judge in one place we have our hallway you know uh doug llewellyn in another place and trying to get all these people in um recorded individually so we have the option like kelly said in the end to go back cut the case down put the litigants you know have iso isolated cameras and we get so far down each road and the software would fail us or not have the ability to do what we want. Um, and, and we looked you know, at some of the early shows, remember like um, that were on like Jimmy Kimmel, we're like, well, what are they doing? Look, they've got remote guests. And we talked to people in post that we knew and it's like, Oh yeah, we just send them a backpack to their assistant um, with, a, you know, this nice camera that can hook up, you know, it's a network camera and blah, 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 and a little lighting package. And, I mean, in a, in a tape week, we'll have a hundred litigants across the country. Um, and the, the turnover time, uh, Michael Moser in the uh, chat pod asked, he wanted to know what is, what, how fast is the turnaround for a single episode from the time you get the cases till it actually, actually airs? Good question. Kelly? Um, <laughs> so I would say um, by the time it's in the can um, to, uh, it, we would it, we take about four weeks to work on all of these uh, shows. We, we'll have you know, uh, like in four weeks uh, we do uh, fifteen shows to twenty shows, and then a couple weeks beyond that it's airing. So um, you know, within two months, I'd say, right? Yeah, yeah. We were and we work in sort of month chunks because in it we 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 get a month's worth cut of cases and then we have to record uh the uh harvey levin who interviews people and is in between the cases and those are those are all recorded um for that month's worth of shows and then scott will build the final show with all the graphics and the music and the all the different pieces so that takes another couple of weeks wow wow so that's uh so you managed to get through the uh, the season, but in in going to a remote workflow, I mean, one of the big things that you guys ended up losing was, you know, that controlled environment to shoot in. Obviously, with these, uh, you know, the litigants kind of, you know, broadcasting from their coffee tables. How'd you guys figure out what what solution did you end up going through with, uh, um, you know, especially with the sheer amount of of litigants that you're dealing with. Uh, yeah. What, what it ended up happening there? So there's a lot of pieces, and um, um, 
it, it, you know, on the production side, um, we, we found, um, we, we use a company called Quicklink that has hardware and software um, to make the connections to our control room. So we, we, we found that we couldn't just do a Zoom call and try to rec record the individual pieces. So we, using Quicklink, um, the, we, we can have professional cameras for the judge and the guy in the hallway, um, Doug Llewellyn, and we can have people's, their own computers and phones just with a link and that all goes into Stanford, Connecticut control room where we still have the control room with the colorists and the sound mixer and the whole team. Um, and they are recording in the way we always do, um, but they, they don't have the same control obviously over that stu lit controlled cameras in the studio. Um, and the internet, uh, we're, you know, we're dealing with the internet. So those connections really just depend on each individual's connection. So some, sometimes it'll look fantastic. It's amazing that they're on an iPhone in the living room, um, you know, and then other times it's like, how could this air? And we, we do send a very cheap consumer camera to each litigant to record while at the same time. And, Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but they've saved many, many, many cases where the judge is able to adjudicate the case. She can hear and see enough, but it's just not arable. And we have the audio and video from, from um, these cameras. Now, the other piece is post. So we went from a controlled environment with a line cut and four cameras to the same feeds but then also these other cameras that are being FedEx to us um, uh, at random times. And so in addition to going remote, when the pandemic hit, we chose to switch from Avid to um, Premiere Pro. And one of the main reasons was we, we found it very flexible to start, uh, s set up a project, start um, with the, what we've, recorded in the control room. And then as these cameras come in, we can open up the multi-cam source, add uh, these cameras that come back, add those files. The sync is off because of the internet, which we've never had to deal with before. You can go into a multi-cam source and adjust the sync on each video. Um, now we have all these different audio sources that we can swap out. So I'd, that that's the basic, um, way we, we went about it is we, we now have sometimes, you know, up to nine cameras or feeds that we are, can choose between as we, and it's not just covering edits that we cut, it's replacing entire shots with a different camera, different source, different audio. Um, and then trying to, again, we, we don't have the time to send it off to the sound department to sweeten and mix and then to a color. So we are able to do all that in um, Premiere Pro. Um, and then, you know, and you saw, you saw the John Oliver clip. It, it, I think the audience understands that people are at home doing a video conference. So they'll accept a different level of, uh, of quality. And that was the first week that John Oliver clip. So, we, we've gotten better at it, I think. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's a learning experience. And uh, yeah, you guys, you know, talk about trial by fire, getting it out there and, and getting a workflow in place and, uh, and and getting the show adapted in this environment. I got to got to hand it to you guys for keeping, you know, the same feel with, you know, the that that whole concept of, you know, the plaintiff and the defendant standing at the podiums. Um, I love the fact that you guys have monitors there. You do like the little, you know, push-ins into those and, uh, you know, still keep the same flow of the show, which I think is something that, that people expect. And you manage to pull that off in a remote, uh, in re remote workflow. Was that, was that a really important thing from the, uh, like from a producer's perspective was to kind of keep the show, you know, on the same path that it's been? Definitely, you want to keep that brand. You want um, 
um, I mean, you know, like I said before, we, we had all the elements, you know, it's the story, you know, that's, you know, what, you know, what the viewers want, that story, the drama, uh, the courtroom. And, um, and then it's like how to marry, you know, these editing the story and the art of that with this huge technical challenge, which I keep going back to Jamie and Scott, which that was, you know, um, you know, for, for the entire team, a huge challenge, you know, because we have some people that are very good technically, Jamie and Scott, and some of us who are more interested in, you know, editing and telling a story. And, you know, so, you know, we all had to like, you know, get, you know, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was a growing experience for sure, learning. Prior, prior to this, how much work just like like modifying or changing color did you have to do to an episode? Was that something that was even on the radar or? No. And now what? Uh, I mean, the, the, the only element would be Scott because he, he was the only person dealing with a, a piece of media that was coming not from the set. You know, there was Harvey right. Levin would, would interview. So he, he might touch touch that video to just make sure that it, fit coming out of this studio. But other than that, we, we had a controlled, um, just in, we, we were in an online environment from the beginning, basically. You know, and, and just to jump in, cause we're talking about the, um, you know, the challenges, you know, for us too, it was super important that the judge was able to interact with the litigants in essentially real time because you, we've all been on these where if there's any delay, it's like they're speaking and then you're speaking over each other. And so we had to really, you know, in sort of paring down how we were going to do this, it had to feel like, you know, you're, you're having, it, it's a trial and she wants answers and, you know, you, you got to be able to do it in real time. And so that was a, a big challenge to try and get it. And I mean, you know, as, Jamie said, there's definitely moments where we've lost litigants or there's bad connection, but for the most part, um, I mean, to me, that, that was like the biggest challenge was trying to get it so that people can speak, hear each other through headphones. I mean, it's just the whole technical. And yeah, there, there's part of the technical thing was beyond what we're dealing with just in post, but the, it had to be set up in a way that not just that we could see them and record them. She what they're seeing is a split screen of the judge and the other litigant, which they have to do. You're in court, you're allowed to always see what the other litigant is saying about you. So when there is a technical problem, the, 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 the person who's still there can't keep talking to the judge. She says, hey, just hold on. Um, you can't speak to me until the other litigant is there. So uh, they see a split screen with the judge and the, the litigant in real time. And then the judge has all the evidence that they've submitted um, on her iPad. So that's another feed that uh, when she is using needs to be sent to the screen of the litigant. Um, and so that they are seen and you'll, you'll see it all the time. I mean, the cases live and die on evidence. And so you'll see all the time where, it, you know, they're looking at the evidence on, on their screen, just as, Carl, you were sharing John Oliver clips and um, uh, yeah. And if we didn't make it clear that the, the judge is in her home in Miami. Um, wow. So her, her, she has donated her living room to, <laughs> to this And Doug project. Llewellyn is in, is in his home. Yeah. Wow. Right. wow. So it's truly remote. There's nobody uh, sitting back at the desk at that point. I, 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 I was curious about that because, uh, you know, I thought maybe the judge would still be up there and, and look at the two litigants on screen there. But it's it's cool how it, how it, you know, it all came together. Um, Scott, I want to talk to you a little bit about the graphic design and the nature of the show, the elements in the show you know, go back 20 years. And uh, I know you and I, we went through and kind of looked at uh, some new workflows with moving to, you were, you, the original ones were done in After Effects. I know you had a bit of a challenge trying to get the original comps and the original projects back and uh, kind of migrate them forward to start taking advantage of things like motion graphic templates. You want to talk a little bit about that, that journey? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, one of the, the big advantages in, when we switched over to Premiere, which we had been discussing for a while, is that when you, in the clip that you showed, the, the quintessential walk down at the people's court when they're standing at the podium and it's like 
John so-and-so is suing plaintiff and that readout that comes out years ago when the show was, was done in a control room differently, they would do that using Chiron and it was done live right onto the line cut. And then when we moved to sort of a, a post online workflow where we did all of that on, on our own, I started building them in After Effects. And, you know, there was a bit of tricky because it reads out the speed of it is based on how long it is. And so it wasn't just simply reading it out at the same, you know, depending on how long the name is, it reads out differently. And I would do all those in After Effects. You know, we shoot a tape week and have, you know, 90 of those things to do. And we do them all in After Effects, render them all out, then go into the Avid and have to import all of them. And invariably, you know, there's a spelling mistake or in some cases when we're editing, things change and they may have been suing with a countersuit and we dropped the countersuit because throughout the trial that ends up being dropped out. So we have to get rid of that. So it's back to After Effects, make the changes, export, import, you know, it's just this whole round trip thing that um, could be a bit tedious. And so when, when we were switching to Premiere, you know, the idea of using Mogarts to build that in After Effects and then allow the editors as they're working to just type in the name and it pulls it in and does it live has been, at least for me, a huge relief to not have to, um, to deal with that part of it. You know, we use the same, we set up Mogart for the, a lot of times we have to transcribe phone calls. So um, rather than trying to, you know, sort of build it every time we've built a Mogart that you can tell it one or two lines and adjust. I mean, those sorts of things, like they seem trivial, but when you're doing the amount that we do um, to not have to sit there and, run back and forth and export and import, um, it's been huge. And you know, the most recent thing is, you know, I was dealing with you a couple of weeks ago is where as we update the open, the show open, which I think you caught part of, you know, we want to swap out the images in the open to keep it fresh with new stuff all the time. And with the new, in the beta version, you're allowing, you know, basically hot zones that you can put into an After Effects comp. And then once you're in Premiere, it allows the editor to just swap those shots out without having to go back and rebuild the whole thing. So, I mean, for me, it's been a huge boost to, to have that workflow, the dynamic link and, and Mogart. And Scott, you should mention the, um, the, the graphics themselves, the wipes and stuff. How old are those? <laughs> <laughs> they, the, the current Arrow theme probably goes back to about 2008, 2007. And it's been through many variations, colors. We went from, it was SD originally to HD to 16 by nine HD. So we've had to move those After Effects comps through from you know, 2006, 2005 up to 2020. So that's been a bit of a headache at times just updating them. But finally, I think we're at a point where it seems uh, stable. <laughs> and you've started taking as part one of the things <coughs> now coming in is actually coming from the uh, the iPad that the judge is looking at. And I know that from a from a, uh, uh, a graphic perspective, oftentimes you're like having to go in and like mask out different segments to really kind of focus the audience's attention as well. So, Jamie, I know yeah, I've, I've worked with you on some of that as well. But uh, you guys want to talk a little bit about that's a new element for the show, right? You guys didn't have to deal with that in the past. Yeah, I mean, there were times, I think in the, in the past, in, in the past though, she'd be holding something up um, and they'd close in and then we'd usually have a copy of it that we could bring, bring in the still. And I, I recall in the, in, the, in, in the past highlighting certain things, Kelly, if it, if it were important, but now that it's all on her iPad and she's flipping through it, um, it's become sort of standard operating to, to um, if she's reading someone's texts, um, we, we, we can just um, using the, I, I use the Lumetri panel to actually just darken everything else and, and put a mask over the lines that she's reading. I know there's a, there's a million ways to skin a, a cat in, in, in all Adobe programs, I think, but um, <laughs> that's well, how. Speaking of Lumetri, how quick did it take you to get up to speed with, you know, using it for stuff like matching cameras and, and doing some of the color work that you have to do now in pose? Jamie. Yeah, luckily, <laughs> yeah, I, I am not a, a, a colorist, but the... the um, you, you do have a master's degree from USC. I just want to point that out in the film, <laughs> film, and, film and television department. So it's, yeah, it's not I don't, to you. 
Right. I don't remember learning that part, but the, um, the, the, the colorists on the show actually uh, have helped us because they do go into Sanford, Connecticut in a COVID, they, they have everyday testing and it's a, it's a whole thing. Um, but when, so that when they're on site, they've gone into the edit room that I can remote into. And it's like, I take their guidance on what needs to be done. And then luckily with Lumetri, like I, I've always used um, Lightroom for my own um, personal things. And it's, it's really a, almost one-to-one correlation there. So um, it's been uh, very intuitive in that sense um, to, to use the Lumetri panel on, um, you know, on, on, on a show like this. And we, again, the multicam comes into play here because we, you know, we have all the different shots on different tracks and you can, basically we do it in there because it can be done, you know, after the show's cut, I can go in and, um, you know, affect just the, the, the judge's shot, the locally recorded judge's shot in Miami and um, do it on the master clip so that then it just ripples through to the, um, uh, to the sequence um, in, in every shot. Uh, you know, we, we had an avid um, symphony where you would do it in the timeline and, and attach it. And, you know, there, there, there's pluses and minuses. I mean, Lumetri is designed to do that too. If, if we, it's interesting because the, the multicam is both our savior and, you know, and our curse in some ways. Uh, and if it were a flattened track with no multicam, um, the Lumetri panel is designed to say, hey, uh, go to one shot of the judge. And instead of putting it on that clip, you can clip, click on a tab and say, do it on the master clip and it will be on every clip of the judge. Um, but bec- but the, because we're using multicam, you can't do that in the sequence. You can do it on the clip, but the master clip is grayed out in that instance. Um, but you if know, you haven't uh, guessed, Jamie has a feature request in on the Lumetri panel <laughs> to add like an extra tab in there when you're working on a multicam so that you right. can actually- The tab's there. Yeah, the tab right, is right. there. And there's two just... tabs there and it's <laughs> and the master one's grayed out. I, I think there should be three active tabs, um, one <laughs> for the you're... clip in the timeline, one for the multicam uh, source and one for the actual source clip. And then um, all, my, all my prayers would be answered. <laughs> but- uh, uh, but the multicam, you know, is really powerful um, uh, when we have this much footage, and and th- that's how I use the the Lumetri is on the different, um, you know, and, and depending on what kind of shot it is, whether I'm doing it to the clip or whether I'm doing it to the to the master clip. Did you have any cases uh, like Kelly? Um, is, is there anything that's come up where the technology just got so far in the way you just had to like abort a case that didn't that didn't air? Um, we had one uh, uh, case, just one, uh, which is uh, astonishing. I mean, with yeah, you know, with the amount. If we didn't out. have these Q cameras, we would have lost a lot of cases. Um, and good cases too. I mean, it, it really is safe cases, but I think Jamie, right? There was just that one. I know, I, I'm, it was mine, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And it was just a case where, and it was a good one too, and it was just a, a case where the, the, the camera came back and, and again, we're remotely explaining to them how to set this thing up. They're both their, their, the one on their phone or their computer, and then also this other little camera. And sometimes the file, the cameras come back and there's no file on it. Like they didn't oh, hit wow. record or something. And that was sometimes the case here. Sometimes they come back um, where they put it into a plant to support it so it'll be facing at them. But they put the lens into the plant. <laughs> so all I see is plant and I hear them talking. <laughs> oh, man. But um, the audio saves us in that sometimes in that true. instance. And, it, it, you know, if you think about this show, it's, it's actually very audio. I mean, um, the, the, the story and everything, it's, it's all sound. It really, it really is. And so a lot of these, um, like Kelly said, the plant, but also, you know, probably 50%, if we get a file back, it's also framed from the chin down. So that's not very usable. But if the audio is a digitally garbled 
internet audio that you just, it's grating on your ears and there's no way you could air that. Luckily that saves you. It just take having the audio in, in the room. Um, and unfortunately that one case out of all of these cases for this season, just, it didn't have one of the video, it didn't have the file and uh, the audio, like we would have aired it with frozen, stuttery, dark video if you could hear it well, but it was so garbled that, yeah, that's, that's the one we lost. Was, was the judge able to make a ruling on it? I mean, <laughs> I mean she I was, it was like, you know, I, in 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 World War II, they they tune pilots' uh, headsets. It's like if you listen to those recordings, you 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 can. It's like, can they hear anything? And it's it's tuned to certain frequencies that that the human ear can pick up for voice. So you can hear what's being said, but you wouldn't want to you know wouldn't want to choose to you know hear it. Yeah. One of the one of the folks in the uh, Q and A pod, Gus, was asking, uh, "Do you ever consider like having sending a producer on site to each litigant home?" I'm just guessing with the amount of cases and the cost of trying to do that, and and yeah. I mean, frankly, you know, the the nature of the pandemic, right? You didn't really have an option to to pull something like that off. Right. We right. we we even in the judge's home, we weren't allowed to have people in there. Like there there was one person, but they. They had to be outside, and then if there was some technical issue, the the judge and her husband would leave the room, and the person would come in mass and try to take care of it, and then leave. And and yeah, I mean, this is a volume business. I can't stress it enough. So the idea of sending a, a I mean, I don't know how many producers there are right now, but again, uh, on a typical week of recording, there's over a hundred litigants. Oof. So and then all across all across the country, sometimes they have witnesses. So yeah, sending a producer would be impossible, even if it weren't COVID. Um, and then plus there was that issue. So like I said before, even sending better equipment was out of the question because you you know you couldn't um, you, we just couldn't afford to send nicer right. stuff. And would you would you get it back? Right. Um, I was I was going to say if you I mean, lose the case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's my souvenir uh, cube camera that I'm going right. to hold on to, even if I didn't win the case. Um, just out of curiosity, I mean, you know, in the past, having to have the litigants all come to the studio in Stanford um, probably limited the types of cases that you were getting. Did you see any difference in, like, the, the types of cases that you're, you're uh, I'm trying to pronounce the word in my head correctly, adjudicating? Um, that the well, judge adjudicated. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I knew the well, word. I just brain brain locked this morning. Um, yeah. Did did anything change there? Well, I, it's funny. I, I don't want to jump in on Kelly, but I, I I was just talking to one of the producers, and you know, I asked them that because you know, I mean, with all the technical stuff aside, the show lives or dies by them getting cases, getting these people on our show, and talking them into it, and. You know, you wonder, is it easier? Is it harder when, you know, I, there's definitely been some discussion in talking to them that, you know, it, when we, in the past, when we would have litigants in Kansas City and trying to get them to get on a plane, and fly to New York or uh, to Connecticut for a one day court case, it's hard. I mean, not everyone can take off of work and miss childcare. And so, you know, I think it definitely opened up a lot more cases that maybe would never have done it. Um, as far as types of cases, I don't know that it's changed all that much, but um, it, I think it's, it's helped. The, but on the flip side of things, most of the courts were closed, right? right. You know, in March, when, when this happened, you know, our, you know, the big court systems, a lot of them just shut down. And so that was a whole nother problem to deal with that, um, you know, trying to go through back cases and finding other ways and going a lot of, the, thankfully, a lot of the courts now are online. So, you know, you can kind of go on and you know, find them uh, remotely. We, yeah, that, that's another part of the, uh, of the show is that there are people who go into court systems all over the country and like, you know, go through files <laughs> looking for these cases. So that stopped. Uh, and just out, out of curiosity for the future of the show, I mean, the hope is that this is all going to come to an end. At some point, do you see you guys going back to the traditional format in the studio? Or is this something that you guys are going to 
going to continue moving forward to have these remote cases? Well, I think uh, you know our goal is to get the judge back in the studio. So that uh, yeah. Um, if we can get the judge again. back in the studio, that that on a technical level, that that makes things a lot easier. Um, it's just back in that environment with color correction, sound, everything being just right and out of our hands. And the the litigants, um, I, I, you know, I don't know what we can say. I, I think it's baby steps, probably. Uh, right. Get the judge in. Litigants will still be remote for the for the time being because hopefully we're turning a corner but still it's the same issue of getting people from around the country traveling you know uh into a place in a courtroom so i think it'll be a while before people feel comfortable jumping on and coming in and doing it so i don't know yeah i think we have to play it by ear I do think that we probably are getting more cases or it's easier for our producers to get cases because people for, like to be able to do it from home and travel, <laughs> you know, that that's uh, a big... having having gone to court to fight like uh, uh, speeding tickets and the like, I know, you know, anytime you have to say, you know, I got to head down to the courthouse. It's typically not a fun day. No that's not a fun so, day. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, we're coming up on time here. I've got like one or two more questions here from the uh, the Q and A pod. So anybody watching right now, now is your chance to get questions into Kelly, Jamie, and Scott. Um, Want to go back to let's see one earlier. Um, Dan Maxell Crosby was asking a question about uh, how much time do you typically get to like tech rehearse before you jump right in and you're actually doing the case? Is there is there like a ten minute window, a five minute window? Well, it's kind of a two part thing. I mean, one is we have, you know, we definitely reach out to these litigants leading up to the tape date to do a quick run through. This is how we're going to connect, make sure your headphones work. Let's do an internet check rather than waiting until the moment they're about to go on, um, which is huge because then we can sort of try and get ahead of any problems. You know, we've had litigants, you know, record from their car because they have better internet because they're getting it off their neighbor next door. You know, like we've had, and all those things get figured out the week before rather than waiting with the whole control room full of people going, we got to get the case going. Um, and then just to sort of add on to that, the, again, going back to how we were going to make this show work remotely, part of it is we needed a way to sort of line up litigants connected to us and wed ready to go in. So it wasn't like starting over a whole new call every time. So, um, we do have them in a, a quote waiting room where we can sort of give them the heads up. You got five more minutes. We're about to start. Make sure your camera's on, you're plugged in. So it isn't sort of throwing them into the spotlight right away. That's, that's awesome. There is sort of a, a virtual green room that everybody's kind of waiting for. That's, that, yeah. that makes perfect right. sense. And the last step is that the AD actually has control of this interface and he's the one that drags them into the plaintiff slot and the defendant slot. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, they pop on for him in the control room and he speaks directly to them and can say, look, can you move your, your camera a little bit to frame it? Um, you know, last adjustments, basically tell them what's going to happen. Tell them to, you know, push the button. I forget what it is two times on the little, camera that we give them and is there a red light going so and then off they go and the the judge comes on and wow well, and there's there's a person uh, it's a big job that that scott was talking about con contacting them all so there's there's one person who um that's what she does is just trying to contact them all before the day um wow well, I listen, guys, I really want to thank you for your time. Um, you know, Kelly, thank you so much for letting us share this story. And, you know, Jamie and Scott, hats off to you guys for, for you know, going through and testing and battle testing this workflow. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm super excited that you guys have, have kept the show going through, uh, through all the challenges. Um, yeah, I, sure. I, I, <laughs> any last thoughts, anything that any of you want to share? Just throw it out there. I think it's official. The show is picked up for another season. So that's another yeah. season and nominated for an Emmy. And um, yeah, Liz, our editor, edited that segment we saw earlier. So. 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess we should say there, there are um, five, five editors. Um, pre, Pre-COVID, there were, there were five editors, and now there's five editors and an assistant editor um, to take on some of that workflow I talked about with all those extra feeds and clips and files and a production assistant that helps in, in post now. So you guys have actually grown your staff um, in that area in post-production during this period. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 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 We've been putting in more hours than ever. Yeah. One, one positive out of all this, all this craziness. Once again, thank you guys so much uh, for joining us today. Um, and thanks to FMC for putting on this conference. I think it's uh, incredibly relevant and there's a lot of good information out there. So with that, I think we're going to wrap up the, uh, the keynote here and uh, please, you know, jump into your next track here at the top of the hour. Thanks again.